Thank you, as always, Kelly, for, for so much of an introduction. So much. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I go by Ann. I serve as a pastor here at Midtown Two Notch. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us. Uh, we trust that you'll be blessed as we continue to worship and get into the very word uh, of God. We're going to be getting to that, that parable in Luke chapter 12 that Kelly read uh, in just a moment. Wanted to get our time set up a little bit uh, by sharing with you a question uh, that I'd heard people ask before uh, multiple times. And th this question is, how much money is enough money, right? I've heard this question a number of times. Another way to ask this question is, what, what, at what standard of living would we say, this is pretty good, I'm good right here. I don't feel a need to continue to climb. I don't know if you've ever heard someone ask that question. Every time I've heard it asked, the primary answer that I hear is more. How much money is enough? More. How much money do you need to save? More. How much money do you need to make? More. And I believe that deep within that answer and deep within that response is this belief that we have that nothing is ever enough. Answering more to that question is a subtle way of saying that no matter how much you have, you still need to be trying to get more. And I believe that the data would show us uh, that we in our society today fully believe that we always need more, that we have embraced this idea. A few of the numbers for you. The average size of the American home has almost tripled over the last 50 years. And yet one out, of, one out of every 10 Americans rents off-site storage. So the point is our homes are three times as big as they used to be, and they're still not big enough to hold all the stuff that we have. The United States has upward of 50,000 storage facilities. That's more than five times the number of Starbucks. Currently, there is 7.3 square feet of self-storage space for every man, woman, and child in the nation. Thus, it will be physically possible if we would lay out all the storage space for every person that lives on this world to have their own 7.3 square feet to stand in of storage space. 25% of people who have two-car garages don't have enough room to park cars inside of them. Three point, and 32% only have room for one vehicle. The average 10-year-old child owns 238 toys but plays with just 12 a day. 3.1% of the world's children live in America, but they own 40% of the toys consumed globally. And America has an average of, or the average American has $15,000 of credit card debt. Family, we desire to continue to consume. Even if we don't have room for the things that we are trying to consume, we always, always, always want more. It's never enough for us. The desire to continue to get more is the norm of our society. And as you might have guessed, Jesus got a lot to say about that. Luke chapter 12, we're going to start at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, so this is Jesus responded, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus is like, as much as I would love to get in a family dispute between you and your brother, I'm going to pass on it just this one time. And instead, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter, as he generally does. Verse 15, and he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So this man asked this question about this inheritance. It wasn't a, a at least at face value, it doesn't seem like a bad question. Jesus uses it as an opportunity to speak to everyone. It says He said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all type, excuse me, against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So Jesus, even before telling us uh, the parable or sharing the parable, he gives us two of his main points. The first one, be on guard against covetousness. The second one, life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. One translation says, beware and be on guard. Jesus is alerting the man and the crowd that they are in danger and they don't know it. His request, again, this man's request isn't unreasonable. Jesus, tell my brother to divide this inheritance as both of our inheritance. Tell him to share it with me. But Jesus is like, you need to be careful because you're in danger. You need to guard yourself against all covetousness. 
Now, covetousness, biblically speaking, is having a great desire to possess something. It, at times, it's translated as greed. Biblically, the sin of covetousness is when we think we won't be okay unless we have blank. To help us to, to see and recognize this covetousness that Jesus is telling us to be on guard against, I want to play a little game called fill in the blank. Just say it to yourself. Don't say it to me. Man, if I just had blank, I'd be straight. Man, I don't need a million dollars or nothing like that. But if I had blank, I'd be good. Maybe another way to look at it. When I see people with blank, I think, man, they really living good. When I see people that have this possession or have this thing or possess this, I think, man, they're really living good. Is there any specific type of thing that people have that makes you feel a bit of jealousy? That makes you feel a bit of, of unease about your own situation now because you don't have the thing that they have. This is exposing to the covetousness that's in our own hearts. This might be a nicer car, a bigger house, more money, those shoes, that outfit, that video game, that gadget that I desire. Covetousness is the belief that material things in this world will truly satisfy me and make me content. It's if I just had more of that thing, I'd be satisfied. And that's why Jesus says what he says at the end of verse 15, when he says, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. He's leading us away from this belief. He's helping us and guiding us by telling us the truth. So we don't believe the lies that lead us into covetousness. He's saying, hey, be careful, be on your guard against covetousness because it is leading you to believe something that is not true. Be careful because you're not going to find what you're looking for in all of these possessions that you're looking to acquire. And then Jesus gives us a parable to help us see covetousness correctly. Verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? Remember what I said earlier about our tendency to have so many storage units. Not that storing your stuff is bad in and of itself, but this is exactly what this man's covetousness looked like. He didn't have room to store everything that he had. Here's what he does, verse 18. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. So this rich man has a great harvest. This is a or an agrarian society. And in societies like those, this would mean this man is very, very wealthy. His barns aren't big enough to hold all that he has, all that, the, the grain that he has and all the goods that he has. So he tears them all down, which likely he has to pay someone to do to tear them down. Not only does he tear them down, but then he builds bigger ones to store this abundance of crops and goods that he has. Let's continue on verse 19. And this is what the man says. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. He's saying, be happy about all the things that you have. Relax now. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So this man decides he's got it made. He's going to store up his stuff and enjoy it for all his worth. That's his approach to his stuff. Store it and enjoy it. And if you can get more, get more, make more room to store it so you can continue to enjoy what you have. And he dies that night and loses it all. Jesus gives this parable to teach us about covetousness and to not think that material things can truly and ultimately satisfy us. But my concern is that we might look at a parable like this one. We might look at the man, how rich he was. He had all these things. And we might think, okay, I, yeah, he's greedy. He's got all this excess. He doesn't need all this stuff. This man is wealthy. This man is rich. He can just stop working and just live off of what he has. I don't relate to this guy. That doesn't sound anything like me. I'm not tearing down barns and building bigger ones to store everything that I have. I don't have anything in common with this guy. And the irony of that is that Jesus begins his instruction in this passage by telling us that we need to be careful and be on guard against covetousness. That term, take care, that he used, it means to be careful. 
Be careful of what you say to someone who you don't think truly realizes the danger that they're in. The way Jesus talks about this lets us know that you can be in danger of covetousness without realizing it. And the second that you think, oh, that's someone else's problem. That's what other people who aren't like me deal with. Oftentimes is the time that you're most susceptible to it. Jesus is saying, take care, look out, beware, be watchful. You're in danger. So proactively look out for this in your life and in your heart. Oftentimes when it comes to covetousness, like I said earlier, you're in more danger than you think you're in. And Jesus says, be on guard against all covetousness. Be on guard. That's a term that means protect. It's a term to use to tell someone to protect themselves against some type of violence or harm or danger. He's saying actively protect yourself against this. Be intentional about making sure that you're on guard against this. And the thought that I'm not greedy or I'm not in danger of covetousness because I don't have a lot really shows, I would say, a fundamental misunderstanding of what Jesus is talking about. You see, covetousness is more about the posture of your heart than it is about the possessions in your hand. It's more about what you've believed than it is about what you have received in this life. And on a very deep level, covetousness is largely rooted in not finding contentment in God. Covetousness says, God, you're not enough for me. I need more than just you in order to be satisfied. Covetousness scoffs at verses like Psalm 73, 26, or, or excuse me, verse 5 and verse 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. That term portion refers to whatever is enough for you. When it says the lines have fallen in pleasant places, it's saying the, it's referring to the lines in the lot or the plot of land that someone has when they acquire something or when they acquire some amount of real estate or some amount of land. To say the lines have fallen in pleasant places is to say that what God has given me is enough for me. That this is good for me. What God has allowed me to have is good. It is pleasant for me. Covetousness scoffs at verses like these. The verse is saying that, God, you are enough for me, and the life that you have given me is good and pleasant. Covetousness says, no, I need more if I'm going to be happy and at peace. The amount of covetousness in your heart is not related to the amount of possessions that you have, because for the Christian, covetousness is largely about how you view God. If God is enough for you and you're able to find joy in knowing him and being known by him, then you don't need that thing that you have your eye on or that thing that someone else has in order for you to be okay. And, the, and one of the verses in the Bible I think that's most exposing about what's really going on with covetousness is Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. The Apostle Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry and covetousness, which is idolatry. He's saying those who practice covetousness are idolaters. Those who practice covetousness are those that place the creation over the creator, that they, they seek to dethrone God, so to speak, and put material possessions and money and goods and resources over him. They place material things over their heavenly king. So biblically speaking, whether or not we're given to covetousness is really a matter of worship. Covetousness in the church is when the people of God see the gospel, but don't believe it to be good enough news. They believe, we believe it to be good news, but not quite good enough news for, us, for it to truly satisfy us. That it has a limit to the amount of joy and contentment that it can truly bring to us. I would say it's a spit in the face to the grace of God that he continues to show us time and time again. Covetousness, it affects how we worship. It, it affects how we relate to God. It, it affects how we relate to the work of God and what he is doing in and through his church and in and through his people. I want to press on this a little bit. Covetousness is one of the reasons why many Christians will talk about how the church needs to do more outreach, but at the same time, not, cons not consistently give financially to the church to allow it to do more outreach. Well, I just feel like the church should be helping more people. Are you giving to help the church help more people? 
Well, not really. Not really. And here's the thing I want to point out about that. Just like many other forms of idolatry, covetousness, one of the problems with it, one of the ways that it hurts us is it makes us at conflict with ourselves. Because the people who I've heard say things like that, I truly believe that they desire to see more people reach with the gospel. I truly believe that there is a desire to see the church do more outreach and, and show more people the love of God through word and in deed. But at the same time, there's this inner war, this inner conflict of, but at the same time, I need my stuff or I need that thing. I want the church to be all that God has called her to be, but I need that. I need this particular possession. That's not actually a need. One of the greatest dangers of covetousness is it causes us to confuse wants with needs all the time. Because whatever that you believe truly satisfies you, whatever you truly believe will make you content is now a need in your mind. You now consider that thing to be a need. You, 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 the human soul will always continue to pursue its own contentment and joy and happiness regardless of the situation. So what covetousness does, is it causes you to confuse a need with a want and now the things that I desire, because I believe they will cause me to be content, now take precedent over the things that I believe God wants to do in and through me and in and through his church. And so Jesus warns us, be on guard. Be ready to fight against the covetousness that you might find in your heart. Be careful. Jesus is warning us, you're in danger of this. He warns us of the dangers of covetousness because he doesn't want us to end up like the man in this parable who believed that life was found in the abundance of possessions. Let's look again at what happens to this man, verse 20. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The thing that Jesus sets in opposition to covetousness and this teaching it's being rich toward God. Instead of believing that life is found in the abundance of possessions, be rich toward God, Jesus says. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? And the best description that I can find to answer that question is actually in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 17 through 19 real quick. And this is Jesus talking to those who have an abundance of possessions. Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. He's saying, don't look to money to fulfill your hopes. Don't look for money to fulfill your dreams. Don't look to money to be the primary thing that brings you security in this life. So often it's very easy for us to feel more secure if we have more money in the bank account. This is saying don't put your hope in the uncertainty of riches, but on God, it says. So we don't look to money to be for us when only God can be for us. He says, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now he gets, goes on in verse 18. He shows us what we are to do after telling us what we are not to do. Verse 18, they are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Saying they who have an abundance of possessions are to truly be rich and have an abundance of good works in regard to their money, to their possessions. They are to be willing to use the possessions that they have to help others. Notice this is the opposite of what the rich man in the parable does. You don't see anything in what he's saying about how he's going to try to help other people, how he's going to look out for others, how he wants to be a blessing to other people. He's like, no, I'm, I want these things because I want to enjoy them and I want to have a, a life of ease and rest and comfort. It's all about him. He just wants to store it all up and be merry. Verse 19, he says, this is still what we are to do, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He's saying, no, that they are to be good, that they are to share what they have so that they can actually really take hold of what is truly life, that they can find true contentment and true joy and not just be given to this, this, false, uh, this false poser or imposter, of which is money, which is possessions. My understanding of what this part, what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about storing up treasure for themselves in heaven, and what it means to be rich towards God is that we would value storing up eternal treasures for ourselves in heaven more than we value amassing possessions 
in this life. That we will more so value storing up eternal treasures for ourselves in heaven more than we value amassing possessions in this life. And I want us to think about that for a second. God is offering you the highest return on investment to ever exist. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 6. We'll start at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. He's saying instead of focusing on amassing and storing up things for yourself in this life that could be going tomorrow, that could be going today, Serve God with what you have and lay up treasures in heaven. This is the thing that covetousness prevents. It prevents us from being rich toward God. And I think that's why God rebukes the rich man in the story the way that he does. Did y'all catch the way that that God rebuked the rich man in the story? There's a lot of things that he could have said to that rich man. Check out what he says, verse 20. But God said to him, fool... This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Notice God doesn't call him selfish, though he's certainly selfish. In this parable, God doesn't call him disobedient and rebellious against what God is calling them to, though he could have said that to him. Notice God doesn't just call him sinful, even though he could have done that. God calls him a fool. The definition of that Greek term that's translated fool there, it means senseless, it means foolish, it means stupid, it means without reflection or intelligence, it means acting rashly. The thing that Jesus points out here in this parable is the foolishness of covetousness. Let me try to give an example. I was a pastor who was telling a story uh, about, he used to like playing Monopoly um, growing up, and his mom taught him how to play, he got really good at it, even at times he would, he would beat her. Like he, and he, he talked about how he would love to get, you know, the high price, the high dollar properties. You know, when you got that whole line, when they come around that turn, you're like, oh, we about to get paid today. You got to come see me every time you come through before you pass go. You got to come see me. He said it was a good time with him and his mom. His mom even enjoyed teaching him the game. His mom even enjoyed when he got good and he would even beat her. He said, but the primary lesson that his mom would teach him about the game of Monopoly is after he would win, she would grab everything, put it back in the box, and say, now go clean your room. (laughs) She would grab all his money that he had amassed up, put it in the box, close the box, and say, now go, good for you, you won, now go clean your room. All the money that you made makes no difference now. You're not taking this money with you. You can enjoy this money for a small amount of time, but you're not taking it with you. The difference between Monopoly and real life is that in real life, our bodies will be put in a box and none of it will come with us. There is not a single, there is not a single wise advisor or counselor that would tell you to prioritize small and short-lived gains over larger long-term gains. Why? Because that's foolishness. Because that's foolishness. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Jim Elliott, he has a quote. I use it all the time. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Family, the devil, our enemy, wants to lead us to only look at the here and now. He wants to tempt us into believing that it's too large of a sacrifice for you to live below your means right now so that you might store up eternal riches for yourself in heaven. He wants you to believe that's too great of a sacrifice. That it's too great of a sacrifice to be rich towards God, be rich in good works and in generosity and in sharing. When the truth is, for the Christian, you're sacrificing far more if you prioritize possessions here in this life. One of the biggest lies that the enemy wants us to believe is that when you start following God, now you got to start living a life of sacrifice. Now you got to start living a life of sacrifice and everything. No one sacrifices more than the one who does not follow Jesus. Because no matter what you ever sacrifice for his kingdom, he always promises to bless you with more, be that in this life or in the next life. The life of sacrifice is the one that says, I will give away eternal riches for something that I can't be guaranteed to keep tomorrow. That's the greatest sacrifice. And according to Jesus, it is the greatest foolishness, or it is the great foolishness, I should say. 
to sacrifice eternal treasure for something that will always depreciate in value. And you won't be able to take it with you. The enemy wants to paint the picture of following Jesus as I'm always giving up the good life. I'm always giving up what is good when really the life of not following Jesus is always the greatest sacrifice. And when I say that, I'm not only saying that we're sacrificing eternal riches for temporary ones, but truth be told, having all the money and possessions in this life doesn't lead to the happiness in this life that we think it does. It doesn't lead to the happiness that we think it does. Let me try to prove it to you. In this book, it's called Your Money, Your Life. You can go get the book if you want to. The authors, they, they gather data of different levels of income, and they, and they show it in terms of how happy people report themselves to be. And they put it all on the chart. And what they found is as you're coming out of poverty, happiness increases as you increase in income. But it levels off and it plateaus at about 70000 a year. So it's going up as you increase in income, plateaus at about $70,000 a year. And then when you get significantly above that, it actually begins to decrease. That you actually begin to be less happy on average. Not true for everyone, but on average. According to a Baylor ethicist, and moral psychology scholar, his name is Robert C. Roberts. He says, upward mobility often ends not in satisfaction and peace, but in exhaustion, disappointment, and emptiness. Jesus was right. Jesus was right. We don't believe it. Our society doesn't believe it. Jesus was right. He was right 2,000 years ago when he said it. He's still right today. That it does not lead to the contentment that many of us believe we'll be able to find by amassing more and more possessions. Or well, y'all don't know who Robert C. Roberts is, so I want to tell you a more late great philosopher by the name of Christopher Wallace. There you, go. you might know him. As, you might know him as Biggie Smalls. He said, "More money, more problems." <laughs> the late great philosopher Christopher Wallace. You might know him by a different name. Yeah. Family, if it is surprising to you that the average level of happiness and contentment and joy does not continue to rise. As your level of income rises, you believe the lie of covetousness, and you need to know that. I'm going to say that again. If it is surprising to you that as people continue to amass possessions and amass wealth and continue to gain more and upwardly climb, if it is surprising to you that that does not lead on average to an increase in contentment and happiness and joy and peace, it is because you have been deceived. It's because you believe that money brings happiness. Yes, we say money can't buy happiness. We all have heard the phrase before, but deep down, we believe it. We believe it to be true. And so we acquire and we amass as much as we can. Now, let me say this. Is it sinful to have a lot of money? No, of course not. But it is dangerous. But there are way more warnings to the rich than there are to the poor. Jesus wants you to have money. Jesus made this world plentiful with resources for us. He wants you to have money. He doesn't want money to have you. He doesn't want the resources to have you. He doesn't want you to be deceived. He doesn't want you to spend so much time in this life pursuing more and acquiring more, thinking you're going to have more joy and more happiness and more contentment in this life, all to realize that it wasn't enough for you. That's the biggest problem with the covetous. It doesn't get you enough. What you need is deeper. What you need is more true. What you need is something that helps to fix what is broken with us. And that can only be found in Jesus. That can only be found in our God and in our Savior. So he warns us against the dangers of money. He leads us to be rich toward God with what we have. Jesus came. He gave his life for us. He rose from the dead. He called us to follow him and trust him, saying he will lead us to eternal life if we place our trust and our hope in him. And he wants you to store up treasure for eternity by following him and being rich toward God. Family, as I'm, I'm closing, one of the things that I came uh, to realize more and more as I was just preparing for this, looking at the, the statistics, is that I think a lot of times this actually comes to, we, we don't trust Jesus when it comes to this. We think Jesus is lying. We don't believe that Jesus is telling us the truth, we, we, we believe that we know more than him. We believe we can look at someone else's life, see what they have, and be like, yeah, no, I would find contentment. I, here's what I want to call us to do today. I want to call us to a level of trust in Jesus that may be beyond what we've considered maybe trusting him to be. 
that he came, he gave his life for us. He came to this earth distant. He could have remained in heaven. He did not have to come here to experience suffering, but he was willing to come and die for you, for your sins, for nothing that he did for your sins, even though he was the only one who did not deserve to be punished or condemned in any way. You can trust him. There are a lot of people in this life you cannot trust, and I would never tell you to trust. The one who was willing to sacrifice that for you, you can trust him. You can trust him at his word. If he says something is good for you, it's good for you. If he says something is bad for you, it's bad for you. If he says something, there's something that you're in danger of, then you're in danger of it. Trust him even when everything inside of you believes, well, if I just had more, I'd be okay. Trust him. In just a few moments, we're going to partake in communion together. Jesus said that for his disciples, we are to do this in remembrance of him. And as we look, as we take the bread that represents his body, we take the, the drink that represents his blood that was shed on our behalf, my request is that we would see those as reminders to trust him. That if he was willing to come and do this for us, he is worthy of our trust. And if he says we need to be on guard against all covetousness, then we trust him in that as well.